ask you about a program that I and you both vividly remember because of the sheer awfulness of the weather. I've never known rain like it or a journey to a site like it. So it was it was memorable for all sorts of things. This was Apple Cross uh, near Skye in the Highlands of Scotland, really. Uh, it ended up being called Scotch Brock. Um, <laughs> another good director's idea. Um, what else do you remember about it, apart from the rain, and, and why do you think it would be a good programme to watch? I think it, it sticks in the memory quite strongly, that programme, because I think it's a, it was a scene right at the beginning of the programme that, that, that Mick Aston um, did, where, you, I mean, but you've got this big mound. I mean, you could, you could not miss this big mound that was there, which is why they, they, the owner of the site had asked us to, to go there. Um, I remember Tony, uh, I mean, I was earwigging on this scene when they were doing it, and I remember Tony asking uh, Mick, um, you know, why, you've, still already, you've, almost, you've already started digging, digging holes in this big mound, you know, why, you know, you usually get geophysics, and he said, well, Mick said, well, it's here. It's obvious, you know, you can't, you can't miss the flipping thing, you know, it's, it's, it's round, it's big, it's full of stone, you know, he almost, he almost was saying, well, I don't need geophysics to tell me it's here, you know, I can see it's here, we, you know, so it was it, simple things like that appealed to me, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we, we get absorbed in having to do this, that is almost, almost like a, a routine, whereas it, it's one of those blatantly obvious statements, you know, you can't miss it, and you can't miss where you're going to put your first trench. But what, what also stood out was how incredibly complex it is to unravel something like that. Because you the to, Stuart, could you explain for the viewers, listeners, what is a brock to begin with? OK, well, a brock is a, is a term that's used a lot for in Scotland, because these are very much Scottish monuments, it's it's a bit like I characterise it as a small cooling tower in in what it might look like. I mean, you know, mini, um, it's a it's a mini cooling tower, and it's a cross between between a home and a castle almost in in the the strength and the you know the, the amount of stone they use in building them. Um, so it's like an iron age it's like an iron age home. With, with levels inside it, with floors inside it. And you can imagine this cooling tower made of stone. And usually they have two very thick walls with a gap between them and they're, they're circular. And about 15 to 20 meters high, these things where, where they survive. So you can imagine when well, they're often on a mound. So often when they collapse, you end up with a huge great pile of stones basically. And that's exactly what we had there. But there are also a range of other monuments in Scotland which create huge piles of stones, like very large burial cairns and sometimes even very large roundhouses. So the problem that we had was there was just so much stone to unravel <laughs> to determine whether it was a brock or whether it was a, a burial cairn or, or whatever it was. And that sticks out in the memory that the more stone we dug away, the more stone we found and how, how incredibly difficult it was to, for the excavators to clear enough of it to get a, a clear picture of it at the end of the day. And, and that stuck in the memory because it felt like you were, you know, you were, you were clearing land of stone. You know, trying to trying to get to the soil underneath it, you know, to try and, and cultivate it. it. It felt almost like it was that the more the more stone you took off, the the more complicated it was to understand, rather than get the story getting clearer. And were you, in a sense, trying to set that brook in a in a bigger context? How wide did your landscape stretch? Because um, it was fairly. Uh, cliff girt, I suppose you might call it. It was surrounded by cliffs. There wasn't yeah. much of a beach. What on earth were you doing in all the rain and the wet? <laughs> well, but, well, partly to to look at where the different types of monuments, such as brooks and cairns and roundhouses, things like that, where where they've been found 
around it and up the coast to see if there's any commonality in the topography, i.e. we're all rocks on a certain, in a certain type of place or on a certain type of headland or what was the topography like of the different types of sites. And it, it became clear that there was, um, there was a gap in the distribution of rocks where the apple cross was. There, there really ought to have been one somewhere there. Uh, and secondly, with rocks, you often get um, activity close to them because these are domestic dwellings effectively. So people are farming there. They have other enclosures to keep their cattle in and their sheep, and they have fields that they grow things on. So if, if it was a big, very large burial cairn, for instance, you wouldn't really expect that. But if you started to find activity fields and things like that around it, it will point you towards it being a settlement. So my attack was two pronged there. One to look at whether it's a place where a brock might be or whether there should be one. And secondly, to see if there's any evidence of that settlement activity around it, which once I started uh, roaming, found very, very much straight away. It was just, just very close to the site, almost within about 100 metres eventually. There's a whole area where it's a classic piece of what you call field clearance, where people, the, the farmers in the Iron Age, and you see it a lot on prehistoric sites all over the uplands, to start to cultivate the land. There's so much stone there, as you remember. You have to get the stone off the land to get to the earth to cultivate it. So what they do is dig up the stones and, and move them to the big stones that they can't move. So if you've got a, a great big boulder and you can't shift it, what you do is you pick up the smaller stones and you put them on the big boulder and round the big boulder. And I found these whole areas, areas of clearance cairns, they call. They're not burials, they're clearance cairns where the farmers heat the stones to create little patches of ground that you could then till by till by hand. And there were, the, eventually when I explored, there were lots and lots of these in between the boulders. And these were you know, prehistoric cultivation patches, back gardens, basically. So once I got the fact that there was um, a gap in a way where it's where a brook should be, and then you found all this settlement activity going on round about it, that helped paint the picture of that it was more likely to be a brook. And then, of course, once they dug the thing and got rid of the stones, you could see that it was a two-wall structure, which is exactly what a brook should be. And apart from stones, uh, do you recollect any finds that we managed to uh, find on that particular site? I do, yeah. I remember one, one morning um, walking across the, the campsite. It, I mean, it really was chucking it down, as we say in Yorkshire. And everybody that was in tents, I thoroughly felt sorry for, apart from John Gator, because he was camping and he was wet and he was miserable most of the time. Um, what we, was, was going, going past John Gator's tent and finding that overnight, Kerry and, and, and numerous others had, had festooned his tent with various regalia on the outside of his tent. And I won't tell you what things they tied to his tent, but they were my favorite finds from Apple Cross Tim. Brilliant, Stuart, thank you. Thank you for your views on Apple Cross. <laughs> <laughs>